In this lecture, we will go over the level one reading on introduction to alternative investments. This is a very long reading. In the first two sections, we will cover an overview of alternative investments. Then in sections three, four, five, and six, we will spend a lot of time on four major subcategories within alternative investments. And those are hedge funds, private equity, real estate, and commodities. Then there is a brief section on other alternative investments. And finally, some discussion on risk management related to alternative investments. On this slide, we will define alternative investments and then talk about the general characteristics of alternative investments. To understand alternative investments, let us make sure we know what is meant by traditional investments. By traditional investments, we mean long only positions in stocks, bonds and cash. Everything else then becomes alternative investments. And on the previous slide, we took a look at the major categories that fall under alternative investments and those are real estate, hedge funds, private equity and commodities. In this box, you can see the various characteristics of alternative investments and keep in mind that this list is a generalization. Over the next several slides, we will look at the specific characteristics of the different types of alternative investments. But I would encourage you to learn this list. The fees tend to be high because if you take hedge funds or private equity funds, they require a lot of active management, they require expertise. So obviously the management fee will be relatively high. Low diversification within alternative investment portfolio the point here is that within a given alternative investment portfolio, the diversification is relatively low. To understand this point, let us look at an uh, example. If you take a stock portfolio, it is reasonably easy to buy lots of stocks, say 20 to 30 stocks, and create a diversified portfolio. On the other hand, if we take a private equity fund, which is one type of an alternative investment, there we make fairly large investments in different portfolio companies. And this is something that we'll talk about later. But the point is, since each investment is substantial, it is not necessarily easy to create a diversified portfolio over here. Very often with alternative investments, there is a high use of leverage, Investments tend to be illiquid and there are often restrictions on redemptions. This means that it is not easy to pull money out. Narrow manager specialization. This means that in alternative investments, you will find managers who are focused on a particular sub area. So going back to private equity, let's say that within private equity, we have multiple subcategories. One of those subcategories is called leveraged buyouts. You will find managers who are focused on this area. So fairly high degree of specialization. With many alternative investments, there appears to be a low correlation with traditional investments, which leads to a diversification benefit. Generally, alternative investments are less regulated compared to traditional investments. And then that means there is less transparency, limited and potentially problematic risk and return data. As we have seen earlier in a reading on security market indices, and we'll also see this later in this particular reading. When you look at hedge fund indices or private equity indices, the risk and return data will have biases the return data will probably be upward biased because the data reported to the index creator is based on what the constituents report. So there are issues that we'll talk about later. Right now, just remember the fact that the risk and return data is potentially problematic. 
And finally, there are unique legal and tax considerations associated with alternative investments. As long as you have memorized the list I just showed you, I think you'll be in reasonable shape. Here is possibly a sort of question that you might see on the exam. If you were careful about the list I just showed you, you would recognize that the correct answer here is B. Also take a look at example 1 in the curriculum. Here are the different categories of alternative investments and I'll not describe them here because we'll be talking about each of these categories in detail. On this slide we'll talk about some general strategies and concepts which impact return. Broadly speaking there are two portfolio management strategies active management and passive management. Passive management relies on a beta return when we talk about beta return, this is the return associated with taking systematic risk. If you invest in a index fund, which is based on the S&P 500, what you are looking for there is a beta return. Think of the S&P index fund as a totally diversified fund. So you only have systematic risk. There is no non-systematic risk the return would be called a beta return. Alpha return is the return that you get when you exploit inefficiencies in the market. If you believe certain securities are underpriced and you invest in those securities, the extra return that you will get is called alpha return. That's also called abnormal return. Passive managers assume that markets are efficient and rely only on the beta return. Connecting with my example earlier, if a manager puts his money in the S&P 500 index fund, he would be classified as a passive manager. Active managers assume that inefficiencies exist and can be exploited. In the alternative investments universe, generally, managers tend to be active. Now we look at the portfolio context and the integration of alternative investments with traditional investments. Several alternative investments are perceived to have a relatively low correlation with traditional investments. For example, commodities are perceived to have a low correlation with stocks and bonds. This is one fact. Another point is that certain alternative investments such as private equity tend to have higher returns compared to traditional investments. If we put these two points together and especially this one related to low correlation then at least in theory there is going to be a diversification benefit if we add alternative investments to our portfolio. And to illustrate this point, let's say that we have a given portfolio that is made up of our traditional investments such as stocks, bonds and say 5% in cash. Let's say that the sharp ratio for this particular portfolio is 1.2. If we take this portfolio and we add some alternative investments. So we create a new portfolio where 90% is still our traditional investments but now 10% of the portfolio consists of alternative investments such as say hedge funds and commodities. Then if this does hold true the sharp ratio will go up. Let's say that when we do this the sharp ratio goes up to 1.3. What this then illustrates is a diversification benefit. Presumably, the alternative investments have a low correlation with traditional investments because of which the sharp ratio goes up. Here we talk about different investment structures. The most common one is a partnership and this is used both in hedge funds as well as in private equity. So, the fund itself is the general partner 
and this is often created as a LLC or limited liability company and then the investors are called LPs or limited partners. The fund, which is the general partner, charges a management fee based on assets under management plus an incentive fee based on realized profits. We'll see this material in detail when we talk about hedge funds. Many students ask the question, what is a hedge fund? Unfortunately, several textbooks give a vague answer to that question, which leaves students confused. But I like the strategy that is used in the curriculum where they describe the origin or the genesis of the hedge fund industry and then talk about how the industry has evolved. Alfred Winslow Jones, so that's this person over here, created a fund which was called a hedged fund in 1949. The purpose of this fund was to hedge long only stock positions. The way you can think about it is that at this stage in time, most investors had standard long only stock portfolios. So those who were rich enough to invest in the market would take long positions and a common sort of portfolio was several positions or long positions in stocks. Now, given that Alfred Winslow Jones had such a portfolio, which was long only on stocks, and his friends or clients also had similar portfolios, his bright idea was to create another fund called a hedged fund, where this fund would hedge the risks associated with the long only portfolio. So for this new fund, the hedged fund, he followed three key tenets and those are shown right here. Always maintain short positions and you can see that by maintaining short positions, he hedged long positions. If the market crashed, then this fund would do well. In order to magnify returns, he used leverage and in terms of a fee structure, he charged an incentive fee of 20% of profits. So he did not charge a fee based on assets under management. He would simply say that if there is a profit of 100, then he would keep 20 and the remaining 80 would go to the investor. So this is how the industry started. And you can see why the fund was called a hedged fund. Eventually, the term hedged was shortened to hedge. So we had the genesis or the origin of the hedge fund industry. Here I want to point out that the story that I just told you is true, but this is probably not testable. It just helps you understand where and how hedge funds started. Now the industry has evolved considerably. It is a pretty large industry, which is why we are studying this industry. Several different strategies are used, which we will talk about shortly. But what you need to understand are the characteristics of a typical contemporary hedge fund. So a hedge fund today doesn't necessarily follow this particular strategy. There are several strategies. And what you need to do is read these characteristics a few times. And I'll highlight the most important points. Hedge funds tend to be very aggressively managed. And these funds require portfolio managers who are extremely skilled. They will often invest across different asset classes. As with Alfred Winslow Jones's hedge fund, they will tend to be leveraged. They will take both long positions and short positions, and they will often use derivatives. The goal often is to generate high returns, either in an absolute sense or a high return over a particular benchmark. The restrictions tend to be few. These are set up as private investment partnerships, and they often impose restrictions on redemptions, which means that it is not very easy for investors to pull out money quickly. Here are the different hedge fund strategies. Now, as a general point, the categorization here 
is representative. In different textbooks, you will find different categorizations. We obviously will go with the categorization that is presented in the curriculum. So at a high level, we are saying that there are four categories of hedge fund strategies. You need to know these four categories and the basic point related to each category. So for example, the first category is event driven strategies. Here the hedge fund will profit from short term events that are expected to affect individual companies. A specific strategy that falls in this category is called merger arbitrage. And the point here is that when you have a large company, let's say we call this company the acquiring company. If this company is going to acquire a target company, then the moment news comes out of this potential acquisition, generally the stock price of the target company will go up and at times the stock price of the acquirer comes down. Now, if a smart hedge fund manager anticipates that a particular company is a potential target for a larger company and takes a long position over here. And if he suspects that the stock price of the acquirer might come down, then he might take a short position in the acquiring company. A strategy that is based on taking such positions where there is the likelihood of a merger that strategy is called a merger arbitrage strategy. And notice that this strategy is based on a certain event, the event being an acquisition taking place in the near future. Similarly, we have other strategies that are based on event. I'll describe these very briefly. I think the probability of being tested on the subtleties of these strategies is very remote. You will see this material in more detail at level two, but to be safe, knowing a sentence or two about each strategy will be helpful. Again, I emphasize that it is more important to understand the larger points. And then based on the name, you should be able to make an educated guess about what each of these strategies mean. So we've talked about merger arbitrage. With distressed slash restructuring, the idea would be that you invest in distressed companies where you believe there is a chance that the company will be restructured and will do well. Often when a company is distressed, the stock price falls and possibly it falls to a level below where it should be. So generally when the market is gloomy or the outlook is negative, then the impact tends to be pretty severe. If you believe that the situation actually is not as bad as the stock price might indicate, and a restructuring will improve the prospects of this company, then you might take a long position. There are other techniques that can be used, but what I have just said should give you an idea. An activist strategy would involve actually getting involved in the distressed company and trying to make it better. Second, we come to relative value strategies. Here we profit from a pricing discrepancy between related securities. And again, I emphasize related securities. Here are the specific strategies, fixed income convertible arbitrage. This strategy typically involves buying the convertible bond issued by a particular company and simultaneously going short on a stock issued by that company. Effectively, this is a zero beta strategy and it is aimed at exploiting possible mispricing of the convertible bond and or the stock. I would say that at this stage, you simply recognize the names associated with the other strategies and you can see that a fixed income asset backed security would have something to do with asset backed securities this strategy would have to do something with the volatility of the underlying instruments and so on. I think that the probability of being tested on the details is very low. But if you want to be super diligent, you can read the two, three line explanations in the curriculum. Macro strategies profit from economic trends evolving across the world. Trades are based on expected movement in economic variables. So if you trade based on your view on the movement of interest rates, so if you expect interest rates to go up globally and you trade based on that, or you, or if you have a certain view on currencies or inflation, 
then that would be referred to as a macro strategy. Equity hedge strategies, these strategies profit by taking long and short positions in equity and equity derivative securities. By equity derivative securities, we would refer to securities such as equity swaps, for example, or forwards and futures where the underlying is equity. A market neutral strategy would involve taking both long and short positions in the equity market. The long positions would obviously be in stocks which are undervalued, short position would be in stocks which are overvalued. This also would be an example of a zero beta strategy, that's why it's called market neutral. This strategy aims to do well regardless of how the market performs. As far as these other strategies are concerned, I think your strategy can be to recognize the fact that the name has something to do with the strategy. So it again is very difficult to memorize all the details, but if you are smart on the exam, you can see that a fundamental growth strategy has something to do with growth. So we invest in stocks which have growth potential. Fundamental means that we do some fundamental analysis. With this one, again, fundamental analysis and invest in value-based companies. Quantitative directional, again, quantitative analysis and based on maybe the direction in which the stocks are headed. Short bias would mean more focus on taking short positions. Sector-specific would imply focusing on particular sectors. Here is the sort of question that you might see on the exam and if you have followed what I just said carefully, this should be easy. The correct answer is market neutral.